Who are some of the most despicable criminals around? Let's find out. Starting with number six, the fake Nigerian billionaire. Dozi Mobwasi is the supposed billionaire fraudster who disappeared from his swanky London home. He vanished once he found out he was on the FBI's radar for allegedly pulling off a massive securities fraud scheme. As of the release of this video, Mobwasi is currently accused of making false claims about his companies, Tingo Mobile and Tingo Foods. He's raked in millions through illegal share sales and swiping a cool 16 million pounds from publicly listed companies. Mobwasi, also known as Odogwu Banye Mobwasi, went on a spending spree fit for a king, scooping up Rolls Royces, hiring bodyguards, and even making a bid to buy Sheffield United Soccer Club. He also allegedly left a trail of unpaid rent across the UK. How else was he supposed to waste all of his money if it was going to rent though, right? And just when everyone thought that he was vanishing like Kaiser Soze, Mobwasi reportedly resurfaced in Nigeria, launching a food processing plant with claims of creating thousands of jobs. Which would be great if it were real, but it probably wasn't. U.S. prosecutors dropped the hammer on Mobwasi, accusing him of cooking the books and lying through his teeth about his company's financial health. They claim he pocketed millions through dodgy stock sales and fancy living, all while his businesses supposedly tanked. And let's not forget his lavish partying habits at posh hotels like the Dorchester, where he dropped a casual 8 hundred thousand pounds in less than a year on parties and hotels. Despite all the heat on him, Mobwasi standing firm, denying any wrongdoing and vowing to fight tooth and nail against the allegations. But with the FBI hot on his trail, it looks like his days of high-flying antics might be coming to a screeching halt if he's found guilty. Number five, overcharged clients. Former Merrill Lynch advisors Adam Kaplan and Daniel Kaplan got in trouble after allegedly swindling over $5 million from around 60 of their investment advisory clients. These twin brothers didn't just stop at overcharging fees. They allegedly went on full-on scam mode, fraudulently inflating advisory fees out their clients' knowledge. According to the SEC's complaint, the Kaplans didn't discriminate when it came to fleecing folks they targeted family, friends, and even neighbors. Talk about blurring the lines between business and personal relationships, right? But wait, there's more. The brothers allegedly took things up a notch by dipping their hands into their clients' pockets, siphoning funds through bogus charges to credit cards and bank accounts. Then they used that stolen cash for their own personal gain and to smooth things over with clients who smelled something fishy. For the grand finale, the Kaplans allegedly went full-on Ponzi scheme mode Mode, falsifying documents and making shady payments keep their house of cards from crashing down. It's like something out of a John Grisham thriller. That one's a reference for the boomers out there. Now, the SEC's got the brothers in their crosshairs, slapping them with charges for violating anti-fraud provisions. These guys both worked, briefly, for Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley, two reputable investment firms. So their victims understandably put their trust in them. It's still always good to pay attention to and be as involved as possible possible in anything dealing with your finances. Scammers are banking on the fact that you either don't know or you're not paying attention. Always double check everything. Number four, an orthodox scam. Yossi Engel defrauded over two dozen Orthodox Jewish investors of a whopping $25 million in a scam that involved promises of installing security cameras and bogus property investments in Israel. Engel's fraudulent escapades came crashing down when FBI agents nabbed him at Los Angeles International Airport. Talk about a grand finale to his swindling spree. It seems Engel's web of lies was extensive. He lured investors into his company, Eyewitness Tech LLC, painting a picture of a thriving business installing security cameras. In reality, the company barely had any clients, and employees often twiddled their thumbs waiting for work while Engel caught some Zs on the couch. Engel's scamming ways extended to promising investments in Israeli properties that never existed. He even went as far as faking videos and documents to dupe his victims. Engel's schemes weren't just about making a quick buck either. They were about maintaining an illusion 
erosion of trustworthiness within the Orthodox Jewish community, since Engel is an Orthodox Jew himself. He even set up a small synagogue next to his office, leveraging religious ties to bolster his fraudulent activities. The aftermath of Engel's deception left a trail of financial ruin and shattered relationships in its wake. His victims not only suffered financially, but also endured emotional distress. Engel's lavish spending spree with the stolen funds didn't go unnoticed. He splurged on a two and a half million dollars on currency exchanges, withdrew hundreds of thousands in cash, and even treated himself to a couple of private jet rides and casino visits. The scheme, spanning from December of 2018 to January of 2021, bought Engel a six and a half year stint in federal prison and a hefty $11.7 million restitution bill. The judge was like, no more private jets and casino trips for you, silly man. Number three, an indigenous scam. Kumar Arun Nepali from Cary, North Carolina, pulled off a classic con job that landed him 44 months behind bars. What did he do? Well, he pleaded guilty to 17 counts of wire fraud, running a scheme that duped folks into handing over their hard-earned cash, stealing nearly $1 million. Nepali, leveraging his ties with the indigenous American community in Cary, spun tales of investing in a real estate venture in Orange County, North Carolina. Carolina. He even sweetened the deal by dropping hints about insider info he supposedly had from his job in Chapel Hill. His pitch was smooth, invest now and reap the rewards later, which is usually how investments are supposed to work, so no surprise there. But here's the thing, Nepali wasn't exactly playing by the rules. Instead of putting the money where he said he would, he was shuffling it around to pay off earlier investors, creating a tangled web of deceit, Ponzi style. In a classic case, case of affinity fraud that targets members of a specific group, Nepali preyed on the trust of his fellow indigenous community members, promising hefty returns while exploiting their faith in him. But as they say, the truth always comes out, and Nepali's house of cards came crashing down. Now he's facing the consequences of his actions with nearly four years behind bars and a hefty restitution bill of almost one million bucks. The lesson here is to be wary of those promising quick riches, especially when they're pulling at the heartstrings of your own community. Number two, the care stealer. Rachel Dawes, also known as Rachel Evans, landed herself in some serious trouble for a despicable act. She stole a whopping 30,000 pounds from Gary Stewart, a disabled man she was supposed to be taking care of. And this wasn't just a one-time slip up either. It happened over three and a half years. Instead of using the money for its intended purposes, Dawes went on a spending spree. She splurged on everything from Amazon Prime subscriptions to betting shop wagers, leaving poor Mr. Stewart with next to nothing in his bank account. Dawes's scheme started to unravel when she got suspended from her job for neglecting care records. Another carer, Wendy Beckett, discovered Mr. Stewart living in awful conditions with barely any food or electricity. The jig was up when irregular payments from Mr. Stewart's account raised red flags during an investigation. But here's the thing. Dawes didn't just dip into Mr. Stewart's account now and then. She did it regularly, systematically for over three years. Her excuse? She claimed to be overwhelmed after her mother's passing, but the judge wasn't having it. In the end, Dawes was sentenced to two years and six months in prison and slapped with a restraining order to keep her away from Mr. Stewart. Justice was rightfully served and Dawes left the courtroom in tears, but it's hard to feel bad for her. If she ends up bunking with Pensatucky, maybe she'll get a taste of her own medicine. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right on this video to find out how this son learned from his scamming dad. Number one, the sucker punch. Barry R. Baker Jr., the guy infamous for sucker punching a disabled man outside a convenience store, ended up meeting his end in a motorcycle crash. The dude, already known for going after a guy with cerebral palsy and later getting into hot water for trying to sell firearms to a dealer, went out in a blaze of not-so-glorious glory when he collided with an SUV while fleeing from the cops. It all started back in 2017, when Baker, in his infinite wisdom, decided it was 
hilarious to mock a guy's walk outside a 7-Eleven at the wee hours of the morning. This poor guy had an unusual walk because he had cerebral palsy, mind you. So Baker's bright idea was to imitate his walk, and then, for the grand finale, then he threw a cheap shot, nailing the man in the face. Thankfully, this classy move was caught on camera, and Baker got slapped with some well-deserved charges. But being the stand-up guy he was, Baker decided to do a disappearing act after posting bail. You'd think he'd learn his lesson, but nah. He just couldn't resist getting into more trouble. Fast forward to his escapades with firearms and the delightful hobby of trying to sell them to the wrong people. Add to that some minor traffic violations and a cozy involvement with a group running a contraband operation. Maybe some broth and a potato, and you've got a stew going. A stew made out of crime. But wait, there's more. Not content with his own misadventures, Baker's family decided to join the fun. Papa Baker, very senior, got himself arrested in a contraband bust while his fiance played hide and seek with the authorities, trying to help Barry Jr. evade capture. Barry Jr. was caught when he and his dad's fiance made a pit stop at a convenience store in a small town. While they were there, a cashier recognized Barry Jr. from the news and tipped off the authorities. Soon after, the police swooped in and arrested them both without any drama. It seems like their attempt to lay low didn't quite work out as planned. Unfortunately for Baker, he was involved in a high-speed chase with the cops and meeting his end in a motorcycle crash. In the end, Baker's life turned out to be one big cautionary tale. David Ames was the director of the Harley Quinn Group, a hotel and resorts development company. The Harley Quinn Group was a trusted brand, as it was endorsed by many celebrities and politicians. The Harley Quinn Group worked in Barbados, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. Ames had close relationships with the prime ministers of all those countries and persuaded them to endorse his development projects. Some of the other celebrity endorsers of the Harley Quinn Group included Wimbledon winner Pat Cash, former Chelsea star Andy Townsend, South African athlete Gary Player, and TV property legend Phil Spencer. Ames ran his business from a warehouse in Basildon, Essex. He owns a five-bedroom detached home worth more than two million pounds in rural England. Ames was a gifted salesman and a sweet talker. He met with investors and sold them on the idea of luxurious beachfront resorts, apartments, and condos. He saw Barbados, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines as up-and-coming vacation hotspots that had the potential to reap huge profits. He made brochures and ads, and even assembled a dedicated sales team to market his future construction projects to prospective clients. More than 8,000 people believed in Ames and the Harley Quinn Group, and they had no reason not to. Ames was backed by prime ministers, athletes, and celebrities. He was already wealthy, with a resume full of successful past construction projects. He also didn't ask his investors to pay much. In order to be guaranteed a condo or apartment unit, they only had to pay 30% of the unit's cost. The remaining 70% would be a mortgage. It was a good deal, so Ames sold more than 9,000 units. The potential value of Ames's buildings was projected to be nearly 1.5 billion pounds. The return on investment for these units would be crazy high. Ames promised his investors a minimum of 20,000 pound profits per year from vacation rental income. When some investors raised concerns over the low 30% deposit on the units, Ames brushed it off and told people that he had extra financial backing for construction, that he would pay back over the years as his investors paid off their mortgage. It was clear to everyone that Ames had a vision. He believed the Harley Quinn Group was capable of becoming the next big resort developer development group. Investors believed in him too. After making sales to more than 8,000 unsuspecting investors, Ames made 6.2 million pounds in shares and dividends for himself and his family. His plan was to use their deposits to build the resorts and holiday homes he imagined. But as it turned out, a 30% deposit for each unit wasn't nearly enough to pay for the construction. He effectively needed to sell three units in order to pay for the construction of one unit. He dug himself into a financial hole. Ames thought the only way out was to continue selling more units in order to pay for the ones he already sold. But as he continued on his sales ventures, he started selling units on properties he didn't own. By 2011, he stopped trying to build these vacation homes and instead started pocketing all of the profit. His investors became victims when Ames' poor financial planning resulted in a funding shortfall of nearly 1.2 
billion pounds by 2012, nearly seven years after Ames launched the project. Even though he knew that his project would never materialize at this rate, he continued selling. He exposed his investors to a 100% risk of loss. Ames planned developments in 15 locations, but never broke ground in any of them. Instead, he only did work on a refurbished hotel in St. Lucia and the Buckingham Bay development in St. Vincent. Only 200 of the 9,000 units sold were ever built at Buckingham Bay, but he still sold units while knowing that the development was a complete sham. From 2006 to 2015, investors lost 400 million pounds of their savings and pensions to Ames' big dreams and unending greed. Ames' promise of a 70% mortgage for his investors was never available. It was a lie used to entice investors who wanted the ability to pay off the majority of the cost over time rather than up front. But unfortunately, none of the investors did more research on their supposed mortgage provider, so they never found out that it didn't exist. One of his employees tried to purchase a unit at Buckingham Bay herself, but felt suspicious about the 70% mortgage Ames was offering. Another Harley Quinn Group employee, Michael Slade, who worked in procurement, went to visit one of the company's properties in St. Vincent, but found the entire site chaotic. The situation was nothing like Ames promised and sold in his many brochures and sales pitches. According to Slade, a surveyor's report of the site exposed the surprisingly low value of any of the progress Ames had supposedly made on construction. Slade chalked it up to a lot of waste, poor management, remedial issues, and poor construction. But when he asked to see the contract between contractors and developers that was supposed to outline the building to be constructed on that land, what he found was a simple two-page document. It was a simple list of the types of buildings to be built without any dimensions, materials, or even dates. Ames was interviewed twice by investigators in 2013 and again in 2015. Both times he denied any wrongdoing and promised that he was making progress on the holiday homes. He maintained that he relied on advice from employed professionals and put the needs of his investors above his own. Instead of putting the money towards the resort rental units as promised, Ames' wife and son got a hefty paycheck of £10,000 per month. Only 15% of investors' money went towards construction. The remainder went to marketing materials, Ames' family, and his grand spending habits. He made generous paychecks for agents in advertising. He recruited several celebrity endorsers, including Wimbledon winner Pat Cash, former Chelsea star Andy Townsend, and TV property guru Phil Spencer. South African athlete Gary Player endorsed Ames' proposed golf course on the Marquis Estate in St. Lucia. In the promotional video, Player said he previously invested in one of the Harley Quinn Group's properties and was very happy with the results. None of these celebrity endorsers knew that Ames was running a fraudulent scheme from his warehouse in rural England. They truly believed that Ames was an adept businessman with money to spare and was able to pay for fancy marketing. One of the most ironic features of Ames' marketing tactics was the phrases, a property you can trust. He plastered the saying all over his sales blurbs and had Spencer and Townsend recite it in all of their promotional materials for the company. Ames held celebrity-sponsored tennis, golf, and football academies with marketing videos. In the videos, Ames personally explained his lofty vision for his Caribbean resorts. He predicted major tourism opportunities and received praise from local politicians, including the prime ministers of Barbados, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. This made Ames's reputation even more valuable. Investors flocked to the Harlequin Group as they saw prime ministers and renowned celebrities believe in Ames's mission. Sarah Tricker, an accounts manager at the Harley Quinn Group took several calls from investors asking when their units would be built. After several years, they weren't receiving any updates from Ames about the construction, at some point that was beyond their control. Of course, there was no problem with the bank. It was a ploy Ames used to buy time for his scheme. The real problem was that there was no money to build any of the units because Ames was pocketing all of it. Then there were the phony business contracts with a simple list of proposed buildings without any costs or terms. When investors did a deep dive, they saw that Ames was selling units on properties he didn't own. Some investors lost their entire life savings in the process. England's Serious Fraud Office, SFO, got involved in an investigation that revealed Ames swindled 6.2 billion pounds out of 8,000 people. The SFO revealed that Ames repeatedly ignored workings that the business was insolvent and on the brink of collapse. Meanwhile, he continued selling units to investors. Ames fired any employees who questioned his business practices or started to notice that something was wrong. He told colleagues that concerned investors needed to be 
be put in their place in order to avoid bad press. The SFO found out that a great deal of investors' cash was spent on celebrity-sponsored publicity. Ames was charged with two counts of fraud by abuse of position. He denied the counts but was found guilty of both charges by a jury at Prospero House Nightingale Court in August 2022. Prosecutors told the jury that Ames knew he was scamming investors out of millions and was using all the profits for personal gain. The lead prosecutor, Michael Bowes, said that Ames knew that his resort construction plan was a complete, unworkable business model, yet continued to put investors at a 100% risk of loss anyway. He pointed to the 70% mortgage Ames offered, which wasn't financially feasible. Ames' wife, Carol Ann, supported her husband throughout the entirety of the nine-week trial. Both she and her husband declared bankruptcy at Southern County Court in December 2018, when 24 creditors made applications to the court. After his bankruptcy claims, Ames was barred from serving as the company director and was demoted to chairman. More than 25 witnesses were called to the stand to detail their interactions with Ames as contractors, investors, endorsers, or employees. Every one of them told of Ames's decade-long deception. The jury unanimously decided that Ames was guilty of both counts of fraud. When the jury announced their verdict, Ames hung his head in shame. Judge Christopher Heher predicted a long prison sentence to be handed down in September 2022. But the Ames family crimes didn't stop there. Back in 2014, his son Matthew Ames was jailed for three years and four months for executing a 1.6 million pound Ponzi scheme by setting up fake carbon credit and teak-free investment schemes. He promised investors an immediate 12% return on investment, which he knew wasn't achievable from the start. Matthew was a green finance industry executive who owned a company called Forestry for Life, supposedly dedicated to protecting the Amazon rainforest. Much like his father who sought out celebrity endorsers to attract attract investors, Matthew hired James Middleton, the brother of the Duchess of Cambridge, to support his company. Middleton posed on behalf of Forestry for Life at a carbon trading expedition in London in October 2019, even though Ames was already under investigation by the Financial Services Authority. Matthew also hired England World Cup champion Jack Carlton and renowned athlete Sir Rodney Walker to endorse Forestry for Life. He created glossy brochures that included quotes from Prince Charles and Tony Blair to promote teak plantation projects in Sri Lanka and protection of the Amazon rainforest. The company said it would offer carbon credits to investors to be used to plant trees and offset their carbon footprint. But in reality, Forestry for Life didn't purchase any land in Sri Lanka or the Amazon. Matthew didn't plant a single tree. They were offering carbon credits for rainforest land it didn't own. The firm rarely gave investors proof of purchase. Instead, he spent his money on rented Lambos, first-class travel, and five-star Caribbean villas. He spent investors' cash on meals at exclusive restaurants like Ivy in the West End and fancy hotel stays such as the Bellagio in Las Vegas, the Savoy, Hilton, and the Mandarin Oriental in Hong Kong. He invoiced his companies for a stay at the Upper House in Hong Kong and tickets to a Manchester United soccer game in Old Trafford. He boasted to investors about his plans to open offices in Dubai, Singapore, Dublin, and India. He stole 75,000 pounds of retirement savings from one elderly investor who believed Matthews claims that the teak market was rapidly outpacing the gold and oil industries. He set up a Ponzi scheme and paid old investors with the money from new investors. The company director was finally caught after he sold fake carbon credits to an undercover reporter in August 2010. Both of his companies, Forestry for Life and the Investor Club, were liquidated in March 2011 with debts of over 1.6 million pounds. Matthew took the stand at the trial to claim that he wasn't able to plant the 5,000 saplings he pledged in Sri Lanka because he was having trouble securing the right land. He also claimed that all of his investors' money was put towards legitimate expenses. A jury of six men and six women in the Owlsworth Crown Court found Matthew guilty of two counts of fraudulent trading by majority verdict. In March 2014, Judge Paul Dugdale sentenced him to 40 months imprisonment for swindling many members of the public, many of whom were elderly retirement savers. The judge noted that Matthew personally visited all of the investors who lost their money in this scheme to apologize, but that this should never have happened in the first place. The judge originally planned to sentence him to five years behind bars, but reduced it to 40 months for Matthew's ability to recognize his wrongdoing. Prosecutor Anthony Swift advocated for an even longer sentence, saying that the defendant was
was no stranger to white-collar crime after being banned from company dictatorship for 13 years, a punishment imposed on him in 2013. The defense also cited Matthew's lengthy list of personal problems, including a messy divorce that involved a custody battle over his four children. He also said that the defendant shouldn't be jailed so that he can continue working and making at least 10,000 pounds per month to pay off his investors. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you'd rather have, free housing for life or free food for life.